Well, extra credit for all of you who didn't take some exotic vacation this week and go to someplace warm. Although it's going to be warm here later this week, so we can laugh at all those people that thought they were escaping the winter. It is gorgeous, though. You have to admit, it's really quite beautiful. Uh, I'm the Reverend Ned White, the interim senior minister here at the congregation, serving with the Reverend Jennifer Brower, who is back from sabbatical, uh, the Reverend Natalie Fenimore, who has been off in Nepal at a meeting with the International Council of Unitarians and Universalists, and Nancy Reed McKee, who is off in the city with her husband and her son, uh, doing some touristy things, uh, and we, we bless them all on their various activities. Today, during the service, we're offering our Free Spirits program for children in kindergarten through grade four. I know some of you adults wish that you could be in the Free Spirits program, too. I'll do what I can to make this a Free spirit space. But um, if you are kindergarten through grade four, uh, join the folks in room 15, where participants will be sharing their hopes and dreams and creating a dream catcher with the RE committee chair, Alyssa Howe. Uh, you will notice in your orders of service that you all have a three by five card or white card. And if you don't have that, if you don't have one, if you would raise your hand, the ushers will provide you with one. And uh, if you don't have a writing implement, the ushers will also provide you with a writing implement. So if you need a writing implement or a card, just raise your hands. The, the use for these will be revealed in the fullness of time a little bit later in the service. We welcome you all to UU Cafe immediately following the service in the uh, social uh, hall. And if you are a first time visitor, please stop by the circular welcome desk to receive a voucher for a free uh, lunch. The building is closed tomorrow for President's Day. At 1 p.m. today, uh, there will be an artist reception in the art gallery and a new member orientation in the Beach House Terrace Room focusing on our missions of religious education, social justice, and philanthropy. Uh, I will be leading that, so uh, you have two events to choose at one o'clock today. On Friday the 23rd, together in, to end solitary confinement, we'll have a brief service at 6.30 followed by a film, and at seven in the chapel, the flame and evening of storytelling Orators in Nancy Reed McKee's storytelling workshop will draw you into their lives through the stories they've developed over the last five weeks. And next Sunday, Professor Dan McCannon from Harvard Divinity School, one of the professors that, is in a, a, that uh, occupies a position for which the congregation made a substantial contribution so that that position could exist at Harvard Divinity School, he will be speaking on why you use love institutions at a time of institutional collapse. It may be uh, useful to know why we champion them. He's a brilliant and engaging teacher and will also be giving a workshop on a new book about bringing our UU history up to date on Sunday afternoon. Also at 8.30 a.m. Uh, next uh, Sunday morning, there'll be a peace meditation service in the chapel. Um, in light of the school violence this week, this might have some particular relevance. Uh, a pastoral note, uh, Jean Judd called me and wants people to know she is not shirking her responsibilities, but she has pneumonia and the flu, and that's put her in the hospital where she's concentrating on recovery. We're grateful today that Evelyn Reed, and I believe this is a special day for Evelyn, is that right, Bert? Or sometime soon, two days hence, this is a birthday week for her. So as as a birthday gift to her, she's singing for us. Thank you, Evelyn, that's fabulous. Uh, offer her gift of voice and soul. <laughs> supported by good friends. So uh, there are other announcements in your order of service. Please look at those. But before you do that, uh, this is a time to greet one another warmly. So I invite you to do so at this time.
Evelyn, it seems like we've got some joy on this side, too. Thank you. All of our readings today are from Been in the Storm So Long, a UU meditation manual published in 1991 to lift up the voices of black Unitarian Universalists. The first reading is by Betty Bobo Seiden, a member of the UU congregation in Oakland. Our opening words. We are here today because we want our religious journey to include more than one holy land, more than one vision, more than one scripture. We sing praises in many styles and in many languages. We make a joyful noise unto whomever nourishes and sustains all life. When we look around us here today to see the beauty of diversity, people of various sizes and shapes, heads of different colors and textures, we see an age span of several generations. We are aware of personality differences, of differences in perspective, of ancestors who represent every continent of our world. Come, let us celebrate our diversity. Come, let us worship together. Jim Smith has graciously agreed to light our chalice this morning. As I read words of Lewis McGee, who became a UU minister in 1948, helped found the predominantly black Free Religious Fellowship in Chicago, and who died in 1979. Millions upon millions of people everywhere are drifting from the old formulations, no longer willing to view the ancient myths as religious truths. They are looking for a vital modern religion with a personal and social imperative. We may have it. I think we do. Our religion is a religion of social concern, a religion of intellectual and ethical integrity, a religion that emphasizes the dynamic conception of history and the scientific worldview, a religion that stresses the dignity and worth of the person as a supreme value, and goodwill as the creative force in human relations. This religion can and ought to become a beacon from which this kind of faith shines. Thank you, Jim. Several years ago, members of the UU disability community approached UU composer Jason Shelton to point out the words of his hymn, Standing on the Side of Love, do, in fact, exclude some differently abled persons. After considerable reflection, he revised the title and text to read, Answering the Call of Love. So in the spirit of full inclusion, I invite you to make that substitution as we sing together hymn number 1014 in the Teal Hymnal, 1014, Answering the Call of Love, formerly Standing on the Side of Love. The choir will help us remember to sing the new words. I'm relying on you, choir, to do that. Answering the Call of Love, hymn 1014, invites you to stand in body or spirit as we sing together.
Let's remain standing for our words of affirmation that are printed in your order of service. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve human need. This do we affirm and covenant with each other. Please be seated.
then you'd see and agree everyone should be free. Then you'd see and agree everyone should be free. Freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of belief, freedom of movement. As you use, we seek to build a world in which such freedom is not only possible, but actually the norm. The program life of our congregation is devoted to creating and sustaining this kind of personal freedom, religious, cultural, political. Keeping the program life going is not free. It costs money. The offering that we receive each week is one way that we raise this money to fund freedom. I invite the ushers to come forward this morning for this morning's offering, and Nathaniel will bless your generosity with honey. In a week during which we have witnessed continuing economic volatility, indictments for foreign meddling in our US elections, and another heartbreaking school shooting, we take stock of our concerns and our hopes, our trials and our blessings, our fears and our affirmations. I invite you to come forward now to light candles for whatever is on your mind and heart, either of our two candle boxes.
Let us pray. Gracious God, of many names we speak today out of our grief over the senseless deaths by gun violence of 17 teenagers and their teachers at Marjorie Stoneman High School in Broward County, Florida. So much talent lost. So much potential unrealized. So many families, neighborhoods, faith communities plunged into deep grief. So many questions about why and how we can keep this from happening again. No matter how much we know about the shooter's motives, none of our knowledge changes the outcome or takes away the acute pain of loss. We long to do something that will magically end these mass shootings. Something, anything. We know that change will require us collectively to respond to the impassioned voices of the students from this school who tell us and tell our political representatives that inaction is unacceptable and immoral. Who urge us to expand our awareness of mental illness to support increasing mental health spending for children, adolescents, and young adults, to regulate guns in our communities. Grant us clarity of thinking, even in the midst of our grief and outrage. And grant our political leaders their own clarity and courage to take action. Be with all those still in the depths of grief for their children and spouses and friends and be with us as we struggle to make sense out of what seems senseless and to construct hope out of what seems hopeless. So may it always be. Shalom. Amen.
Thank you, Evelyn and Karen and Ken. This was great. Congregation of your dreams. He had been in the storm so long, over 25 years ago, Henry Hampton, who was then executive producer of the PBS series Eye on the Prize, and also a member of the UUA staff, criticized UUs for not dreaming enough. Here's what he wrote. I'm given to talking about dreams because dreaming separates us from other animals, from other life forms. I have a favorite line from a play I read years ago, a Chaucerian drama. The line goes, in dreams begin responsibilities. And indeed, it's true. When you dream of something, you can begin to take it upon yourself, make it yours, change it. But you have to dream it first. And the Unitarian Universalists don't dream. You have to think of the world as you would really have it. I don't mean wish it. I mean dream it. And sometimes I think Unitarian Universalists wish more than they dream. This may be a particular temptation for us here at Shelter Rock, where we have so much. 100 acres of lawns and woodlands, a huge complex of buildings, unbelievable RE classrooms and playgrounds, millions of dollars in the bank or in our investment portfolio. Why dream when you've already got so much? What more could we ask for? Perhaps this misses the reality. What if we lost all of this? the buildings, the grounds, the endowment, what would be left? The congregation, you, me, the people sitting in this room. You are the heart, the life, the vitality, the energy, the core, the soul of this faith community. What does it mean to dream? What does it mean to dream about our future? I intentionally entitled today's sermon, Congregation of Your Dreams. That's where the future starts, in your imagination, each one of you. In the realm of dreams, we're all equal. Nobody's dreams are more valid or better than anybody else's. So today I'm issuing an invitation to each and every one of you to give yourself permission to dream about your future as a part of this UU community. It said that people come to church because of hurts and hopes. That was certainly true of me when I first moved to Boston in 1970 and started attending services at King's Chapel. When I moved to Boston from a year in New York City after college, I dreamed of a church in which I would feel a sense of belonging, a church where I could practice loving people I liked and people I didn't like very much a church where I would be encouraged and helped to live my faith, to walk my talk, to become the kind of person I dreamt of becoming. I was 23 years old, a graduate of Stanford University, one year of graduate school, working as a soda jerk at Brigham's in downtown Boston. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I was staying with my grandfather's first cousin, Carol Means. She was the first woman elected to the vestry, the governing board at King's Chapel. That was in 1969. The congregation had been founded in 1686. It took a while to bring women into leadership at King's Chapel. So I went to church with her. The service in the prayer book was new to me. This based on the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer. It was formal, archaic, old-fashioned. The architecture was late 18th century with box pews. It was all a little bit strange. But the music, under the direction of organist and composer Daniel Pinkham, was incredible. And the preacher, Carl Scoville, captured me the first Sunday with his profound insights, unpacking the wisdom of the Bible for me, inviting me to look at myself in the light of God's love and challenging me to dedicate myself to being an instrument of that love. I was a closeted gay man, afraid of being open about who I was for fear that I would be rejected, shunned, shamed, that people would never love me. I unintentionally cut myself off 
from others to protect myself. I was both longing for closeness with others and terrified of it at the same time. That UU congregation accepted me with all my hurts and hopes, welcomed me, gave me a community in which I could clarify my values and bring my actions into agreement with those values. Over the 18 years I was an active member at King's Chapel, I sat through hundreds of committee meetings, no, thousands of committee meetings, washed dishes at events, walked to raise money to combat hunger, taught Sunday school, served on the vestry, took notes at meetings, chaired committees, attended retreats, assisted the worship services, wrote plays for the church school, helped organize a young adult group, and eventually, after completing divinity school, asked the congregation to ordain me. I suspect that each of you has your own story and your own set of hurts and hopes that brought you here to Shelter Rock. That's what I want to invite you to consider this morning. What do you dream Shelter Rock might be for you? What do you want and need this congregation to offer you? The mission of the congregation starts with each of you. Fully embodying our mission begins with honoring and affirming the aspirations of you, the members of the congregation, and supporting you in realizing these aspirations for yourself, for your families, for the network of relationships in which you live. In classic community organizing, leaders speak of starting with and being clear about your own self-interest. It doesn't mean being selfish in a narcissistic way. It recognizes that in any situation, we bring our own self-interest with us. And we tend to stay where we experience affirmation of the particularity of who we are. So today I invite you to think about that personally, what you want from this congregation. Maybe more of what you've already experienced. Maybe something you long for but have not yet experienced. Maybe something totally new. In the Quest description of this series, I mentioned some of the areas I knew matter a great deal to members of this congregation. Let me review those briefly to plant seeds for your dreams. For many, the dream might be of a place and a community who help you as parents and help your children grow in wisdom, in kindness, and in their own spiritual self-awareness. For the others, the others, the dream might be of a spiritual oasis where you can know and count on being refueled and restored when you feel depleted and stressed out by the demands of your rough and tumble life on Long Island or commuting into the city. For some, the dream might be of a community that expands your horizons about your neighbors here on Long Island that invites you into relationships with people dramatically different from yourself. For others, the dream might be becoming part of a group dedicated to expanding justice in the world, finding companions for the journey of justice that encourage you, support you, create opportunities for you to live out your deepest commitments. For some, the dream might be of a community of worship, meditation, word, and music that touches you in the depths of your soul and enables you to deepen your spiritual awareness and to sustain your connection with God, higher power, spirit of life, whatever you might call the great mystery to which we all belong. For many, the dream might be of friendships with people who share your values and enrich your joy in living. For some, the dream might be of experiencing a powerful connection with the beauty of this place, the buildings, the grounds, the gardens, the walkways, the woods, all the wonders that connect you to the natural world. This interim period is the perfect time to dream. Two weeks from today, on March 4th, I'll be preaching on the congregation of our hopes, about our collective vision of the mission of this congregation, but today I want to focus on each of you as individuals. This is where those three by five cards come in. In a moment, I'm going to ask each of you to write on a card one thing that makes this, or would make this, the congregation of your dreams. 
You can keep it anonymous or include your name. That's your choice. And I'm going to ask you to put your card in the dream basket on the table next to where I'll be standing on your way out after the post loo. You can't miss it. I'll, I'll compile all of them for all of us to read. Later this spring, we're planning to initiate a pledge campaign about renewing your membership for the year that begins July 1. We're calling the campaign Realizing Our Hopes and Dreams. And we're planning to invite members to talk face to face about their hopes, their dreams, and about renewing their commitment to UUCSR. Yes, this involves making a financial commitment, but even more importantly, it involves making an emotional commitment and a faith commitment. And that commitment begins with your dreams. This is particularly important during this interim period when we're trying to discern how we want our mission to remain the same and how we want it to be different in order to help us determine what ministerial leadership will serve this congregation best as we seek to become the congregation of our dreams. So now I'm going to give you ten, excuse me, five minutes in silence. Ten minutes would kill you all five minutes in silence to daydream a little, to write down one thing that makes this or would make this the congregation of your dreams. For those who want extra credit and are fast workers, use the second side of the card to offer a second thing <laughs> that would make this the congregation of your dreams. And when the five minutes are up, I will ring the bell. Dream away.
Five minutes is a long time, isn't it? <coughs> Our closing reading is a letter to the people of the future by John Cummin. My distant children, you will look back on us with astonishment at the truths that stared us in the face and which we did not see. You will look with wonder at the bright toys we created and used only for the rape of the planet and one another. It will seem strange beyond believing that we reached for the stars and did not know the simplest principles of living well together. But know this also, you of the future, you with your libraries and fountains and your star cities, know that even in our slumbers we dreamed. In our fumbling, shadowed search for mistaken glories, even our clumsy cruelties, it was for you that we dreamed. Beneath the piled up centuries, below the lost and ruined rubble of all of our striving, it was you who lay safe and folded in the womb of our dreaming. You, the first cause of all our daring. Even now it brings comfort to know that it shall one day be as the wise among us have foretold. In that far age, in the chrysalis of time, it will be your source of pride that your ancestors, born into a universe without justice or mercy, bethought themselves of justice and mercy and put them there. Remember us for this. So may it always be shalom, blessed be, insha'Allah, aho, shanti, amen. Please join the choir and me in hymn number 1054 in the Teal Hymnal. Jim Scott's Let This Be a House of Peace, based on a text by 20th century Universalist Kenneth Patton number 1054. And please, as a body of spirit, stand as we sing this together.
Closing words from Melvin Hoover, former advocate for racial inclusiveness at the UUA and minister emeritus of the UU congregation in Charleston, West Virginia. We can't change the past, but we can learn from it and build on it. We can't control the future, but we can shape it and enhance the possibilities for our children and grandchildren. We can't discern in the presence the fullness of our action and their impact, but we can be pioneers in our time, exploring fully the crevices and cracks where knowledge and new insights may be found. We can explore our spectrum of relationships and confront our complacency and certainty about the way things are. We can dare to face ourselves in our entirety, to understand our pain, to feel the tears, to listen to our frustration and confusion, and to discover new capacities and capabilities that will empower and transform us. In the spirit of the pioneer, let us now go forth. Please be seated. <clears throat>